So before we start looking at the early approaches to understanding the brain, um, we're just going to look at a few of the key features or characteristics um, of the brain, okay, just to understand what it is and what are its kind of key characteristics or key features. Um, so when we're looking at the brain, we have to remember that the brain is the master organ. Literally everything that we think, feel and do depends upon the brain. So when we're thinking about the texture or the structure of the brain, we're basically um, mentioning that it does feel a little bit like firm jelly. It contains many folds. And the reason that it contains many folds is to increase the surface area, okay? Basically, if the brain was to be completely spread out, it wouldn't be able to fit in your head because it would be way too big. So in other words, in order to kind of reduce its size, but just keep all those neural connections and keep all that neural space there, it is basically convoluted. It contains many folds, okay? That is to make sure that the brain is a size that can actually fit into your skull. So we call that a convoluted structure, okay? The brain weighs about one and a half kilos, and this is the fully formed brain. So obviously when you're first born, the brain's not going to be that big, but as you get older and as your head gets bigger, your brain kind of grows as well or develops as well um, to kind of uh, accommodate the increasing size of the skull. The outer layer of the brain, which is the part of the brain that you can see from the outside without dissecting it or without going into it um, or, you know, cutting through it, is called the cerebral cortex. So that's the outermost surface, the outer layer of the brain that you can see here just from looking at it on the outside. So that is called the cerebral cortex. And you would have learned this in year 10 previous e psychology, but the cerebral cortex actually contains four lobes. Okay, we're going to go through this a little bit later in chapter two. Um, probably when we start back at school next year. But um, yeah, there are four lobes of the brain and each of those lobes has a specialized or specific function. For example, one of the lobes is to do with vision. The other lobe is to do with hearing. The other lobe is to do with movement. So they've kind of got main functions there. On top of that, when you're talking about the brain, you have to remember that it's divided into two brain hemispheres. So cerebral just means brain. So when we say two cerebral hemispheres, we're saying two brain hemispheres. Okay, so you can see here, um, this is an actual kind of uh, brain, okay? You can see there's a line running through it. We call that the longitudinal fissure. The longitudinal fissure is just a line or kind of like a separating boundary that separates the left hemisphere from the right hemisphere, okay? So we've got two brain hemispheres there. Um, we've also got something else that connects the two hemispheres rather than separates. It allows the two hemispheres to communicate with each other. And that is a band of nerve tissue. So you can see that I've kind of outlined it here. That band of nerve tissue is basically like a bundle of nerve fibers. And that is called the corpus callosum. Corpus callosum is really important because it allows us to be able to, um, it allows our left hemisphere to be able to communicate with our right hemisphere and the right hemisphere to be able to communicate with the left hemisphere. So it allows both hemispheres to communicate with each other at the same time. This is really important for tasks where you're maybe multitasking, um, where you're, for example, maybe reading a book while listening to music, where both hemispheres of your brain are being activated. So that's the um, bridge. We call that a bridge or a bundle of nerve fibers. That's the corpus callosum. And the last thing to remember is that the brain actually consists of two types of matter. We've got gray matter. And you can see that on the outside here of the brain, it's got a very grayish color to it. That's because of the cell bodies of the neurons. Okay. The cell bodies of the neuron are gray in color, which give it that gray matter. Okay. Will give us the gray matter. And the white matter are basically the axons. The axons are usually covered in a uh, white fatty substance called the myelin, which we will go through later in the chapter. And that um, myelin is actually white in color, which is why the axons are known as the white matter because of the color that they um, show us, okay? So these are basically the key characteristics or the key features of the brain. So we will come back to this. Um, in fact, what we'll do is maybe we'll work on the activity for this. It will just take a few minutes. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna go and flip over to my transition week booklet. So hopefully you guys can open that as well on your end. So just open up your transition week booklet that we were working on last time and just um, head on over to activity six. Okay, and we're gonna write one characteristic that we've learned. We've already learned, I think about a few in that slide that we just looked at. So we're gonna name any four characteristics or features in the brain. So without looking at the slide, let's see how good your memory is. Can anyone name me one characteristic in the chat box, or you can unmute yourself if you like. Um, one characteristic to fill up the first box there. 
characteristic or a key feature of the brain? What could we say? Yep, fully formed brain weighs one and a half kilos. That's good. Oops, I selected the wrong box. A fully formed brain weighs about 1.5 kilos. Good work. Another point, what else could we say? And just write these down guys as we're going so then your work gets completed too. Contains many folds. Yep. We can say it has a convoluted appearance. Awesome. What else can we say? Um, it has four lobes. Yep. And it contains many neurons. Yep. So maybe we can combine those two points. So it contains many neurons, which represent the gray and white matter of the brain. Yep, and there was another point about the hemispheres of the brain as well. So we can say, let me just read that again. Um, left and right hemisphere work together. Yep, so separated into two hemispheres. Good. The brain is separated into two cerebral or brain hemispheres. Remember, whenever you guys see the word cerebral, I know it sounds very technical and scientific, but it just means the brain. So whenever you see the word cerebral, it's just to do with the brain. So the brain is separated into two cerebral hemispheres, each of which have specific functions. And we'll look more into hemispheric specialization later in chapter two. Awesome. So those are four excellent characteristics or features that we can talk about. You can even talk about, um, you can even talk about the idea that the brain is, um, you can talk about the texture of it. You can say that it feels like firm jelly. You can say that it, um, you know, contains or well, we've already mentioned the folds. So yeah, you can talk about any of those characteristics that we've mentioned. So I'll give you guys like um, maybe 30 seconds to jot that down in your own document and then we'll continue with our content. Okay, so hopefully you have jotted that down. Just remember to keep saving your document as you go. So then you can upload that to do work later on. Okay, um, I'm going to just switch over the screen back to our PowerPoint. Actually, we do have to watch a video as well. But before that, I'll just introduce the next topic a little briefly before we go to the video. So the first kind of official proper spread of your book is um, 2A, which looks at historical approaches to understanding the brain. So before we look into all the other kind of more um, complex topics about the brain, first of all, we need to understand historically, how was the brain viewed? And how did people have different views about what the brain did or how the brain functioned? And so we call these the early approaches to understanding the brain. Okay, we're not going to go through all of them today. We're just going to go through the first three, which are basically our early approaches to understanding the brain. Okay, and we call them the historical approaches. Okay, so the brain versus heart debate, the mind body problem and phrenology. Those are the main ones that we're going to go through today. And we'll go through the other two in the next class. Now, this is a very content heavy spread. It's a pretty huge spread as well. It's really big in terms of content. So that's why we're going to try to break it up so it doesn't feel as um, overwhelming because the content in psychology can be quite overwhelming most of the time. So we will try to break that up. Okay, so um, I want to show you guys the video first, and then I'll, then all of these um, other early approaches will make a little bit more sense after you've watched the video. So I will um, screen share that video now. Just give me one second. Where did I put it? It's here. Okay. And... In 1861, two scientists got into a very brainy argument. Specifically, they had opposing ideas of how speech and memory operated within the human brain. Ernest Obertal, with his localistic model, 
argued that a particular region of the brain was devoted to each separate process. Pierre Gratiolet, on the other hand, argued for the distributed model, where different regions work together to accomplish all of these various functions. The debate they began reverberated throughout the rest of the century, involving some of the greatest scientific minds of the time. Aubertin and his localistic model had some big names on his side. In the 17th century, René Descartes had assigned the quality of free will and the human soul to the pineal gland. And in the late 18th century, a young student named Franz Joseph Gall had observed that the best memorizers in his class had the most prominent eyes and decided that this was due to higher development in the adjacent part of the brain. As a physician, Gall went on to establish the study of phrenology, which held that strong mental faculties corresponded to highly developed brain regions observable as bumps in the skull. The widespread popularity of phrenology throughout the early 19th century tipped the scales toward Aubertin's localism. But the problem was that Gall had never bothered to scientifically test whether the individual brain maps he had constructed applied to all people. And in the 1840s, Pierre Florenz challenged phrenology by selectively destroying parts of animal brains and observing which functions were lost. Florenz found that damaging the cortex interfered with judgment or movement in general, but failed to identify any region associated with one specific function, concluding that the cortex carried out brain functions as an entire unit. Florenz had scored a victory for Gratiolet, but it was not to last. Gaulle's former student, Jean-Baptiste Bouillot, challenged Florenz's conclusion, observing that patients with speech disorders all had damage to the frontal lobe. And after Paul Broca's 1861 autopsy of a patient who had lost the power to produce speech but not the power to understand it revealed highly localized frontal lobe damage, the distributed model seemed doomed. Localism took off. In the 1870s, Carl Wernicke associated part of the left temporal lobe with speech comprehension. Soon after, Edward Hitzig and Gustav Fritsch stimulated a dog's cortex and discovered a frontal lobe region responsible for muscular movements. Building on their work, David Ferrier mapped each piece of cortex associated with moving a part of the body. And in 1909, Corbinian Broadman built his own cortex map with 52 separate areas. It appeared that the victory of Aubertin's localistic model was sealed. But neurologist Carl Wernicke had come up with an interesting idea. He reasoned that since the regions for speech production and comprehension were not adjacent, then injuring the area connecting them might result in a special type of language loss, now known as receptive aphasia. Wernicke's connectionist model helped explain disorders that didn't result from the dysfunction of just one area. Modern neuroscience tools reveal a brain more complex than Gratiolet, Aubertin, or even Wernicke imagined. Today, the hippocampus is associated with two distinct brain functions, creating memories and processing location in space. We also now measure two kinds of connectivity, anatomical connectivity between two adjoining regions of cortex working together, and functional connectivity between separated regions working together to accomplish one process. A seemingly basic function like vision is actually composed of many smaller functions, with different parts of the cortex representing shape, color, and location in space. When certain areas stop functioning, we may recognize an object but not see it, or vice versa. There are even different kinds of memory for facts and for routines. And remembering something like your first bicycle involves a network of different regions, each representing the concept of vehicles, the bicycle's shape, the sound of the bell, and the emotions associated with that memory. In the end, both Gratiolet and Aubertin turned out to be right, and we still use both of their models to understand how cognition happens. For example, we can now measure brain activity on such a fine time scale that we can see the individual localized processes that comprise a single act of remembering. But it is the integration of these different processes and regions that creates the coherent memory we experience. The supposedly competing theories prove to be two aspects of a more comprehensive model, which will in turn be revised and refined as our scientific technologies and methods for understanding the brain improve. Okay, so that video basically, I'll just screen share back to our PowerPoint. Okay, so what that video basically tries to show us, guys, is that at the beginning of history, the 
main two kind of camps of psychologists or physiologists, doctors, what they were initially thinking was, is the whole brain as a whole, is the whole brain um, involved in all functions or is it that certain parts of the brain are only involved in certain types of functions? As they said today, what we understand today is that for certain functions like moving your hand, yes, Sometimes it's a specific part of the brain involved, but for other functions that are more multifunctional or more multitask or multi-sequenced in nature, for example, doing like, um, you know, for example, talking to someone on the phone while typing something, that is a multitasking kind of function. So those would require multiple parts of the brain to be lighting up or to be activated at once, okay? So we kind of uh, follow both approaches um, in terms of modern day psychology. So going all the way back now to kind of like the early Greek philosophy philosophers times and what they thought initially um, when they started trying to understand what is the brain and what is the brain's role for humans. Um, the first kind of um, early approach we're looking at is called the brain versus heart debate. It's just what the name suggests. It was this idea that in the early days of Greek philosophy, when the philosophers were still uh, contemplating on what the brain does, and there wasn't much scientific research or there wasn't much experimental evidence to really indicate what the brain was. Remember, this is back in a time when there was no technology, there was no scientific advancement, um, and they didn't have, you know, the neuroimaging techniques and stuff that we do today to study the brain at length. So this was all kind of them contemplating what the brain was about. Certain Greek philosophers such as Alcimon, they basically thought that the mental processes, like how we think and how we feel, were located in the brain. And so this was called the brain hypothesis. In other words, this was called, or this was formed the brain part of the debate. Okay. The heart part of the debate, though, was because other philosophers, um, such as M Empedocles, they actually believed that mental processes were not located in the brain. They thought that the way that we think and the way that we feel was more so located in the heart, okay? And their reasoning for this was that the heart is the central organ of the body, like it's right in the middle of your body. And basically that whenever we feel emotions like happiness, whenever we feel things like love or hate or envy, all of these emotions or these feelings are strong things that we often feel in our heart, okay? And a lot of people used to think that the heart was kind of um, reminiscent of the soul, okay? Um, so that was kind of their reasoning for why the heart was at the center of, of everything we do. Obviously, today, we know that the brain hypothesis is the one that wins, okay? There's no such thing as the heart having much of a role in how we think and feel on a day-to-day -day basis. So the brain hypothesis is the one that kind of is more accepted, okay? However, we're not saying that the heart hypothesis has been entirely dismissed. There are certain things, for example, the way that the heart functions that can influence the way that the rest of the body functions too. It's not like the heart is just some organ that's neutral that doesn't have any effect on the rest of the body. It's just that we don't say that the heart is the master organ that influences everything that we think, feel, and do. Okay, so that's the main kind of point that we need to remember. So that's the brain versus heart debate, um, which was, I think, mentioned a little bit in the video as well. The next one was called the mind-body problem. So with the mind-body problem, um, basically there was this philosopher called Rene Descartes, who was mentioned in the video as well. And Rene Descartes was this um, philosopher who basically um, wanted to ask the question of, is it the body that influences the mind or is it the mind that influences the body? So he wanted to understand the relationship between the mind and the body, the mind basically being the brain in this case and the body being the physical body, okay, which basically is controlled. So he basically proposed this um, kind of hypothesis or theory that the mind can influence the body. For example, if I want to move my hand, it's my brain that allows me to do that. But that the body can also influence the mind. For example, if I've got a headache or if I've got a lot, like back pain or my leg hurts, that can then go to my brain and allow my brain to experience that sensation. So that was kind of the mind-body problem, okay? This idea that it's not just the mind influencing the body in a one-way process, but rather that there was a bi-directional effect or there's a two-way effect um, in terms of the relationship between the mind and the body, okay? That the mind does influence the body, but just as well, the body does influence the mind as well, okay? So that's the mind-body problem. And this is really important to remember particularly when we think about the relationship between thoughts, feelings, and behavior that we looked at last week. Okay, thoughts, feelings, 
and behavior. And I'm going to ask you guys a question now. Um, with reference to thoughts and feelings, do you guys think thoughts and feelings would um, be judged or interpreted more so in the mind or in the brain or in the body? What would we say? Thoughts and feelings, are they more to do with your mind or more to do with your body? Yeah, mind, correct. Okay, the reason being that when we think something, that initial thought stems in our brain. Okay, our brain is involved in all those cognitive processes. And similarly with behavior, when we behave, we say that it's a physical action. Other people can see us doing it. It, it involves some kind of movement or sequence of movements of the body. Okay, in order to carry out that behavior. So the behavior would be the action of the body. And you know that thoughts and feelings can influence behavior in the same way that the mind can influence the body and vice versa. Okay, so that's the basic um, idea behind the mind body problem. Okay, and the last one that we're looking at for today is called phrenology. This was also discussed a little bit in the video. Phrenology is this idea, it was um, basically brought up as a theory by um, this French doctor called Franz Joseph Gall. Okay, this is him in the picture. And phrenology is a type of pseudoscience. Now, does anyone remember from the introductory PowerPoint that we did in the first lesson, does anyone remember what pseudoscience is? If you can describe it in a few words in the chat box. Pseudoscience, what is pseudoscience about? Wait, was pseudoscience like fake stuff? Fake stuff, yeah, science. like false science or fake science. Yeah, like astronomy, astrology, science that isn't yeah. by evidence. Correct. Good. So pseudoscience is basically this idea that it sounds very scientific, but it's not actually scientific. This was Gull's basic idea that he would just like um, feel people's heads and he would notice that, okay, if they've got a little bump on the side of their head, he might try to say that, okay, because you've got a bump on the side of your head, I believe that you're a very secretive person, or I believe that you're a very organized person. So because he was linking it back to bumps on a person's head and he was trying to link it back to brain functioning, it sounded scientific, okay? If you were just a person who didn't have much psychological knowledge, you might say, oh, Gull is a really smart person. His theory sounds really scientific because it did sound scientific. He did link it back to brain functioning, but it wasn't scientific in its actual basis because it wasn't backed up by evidence. There was no experimental evidence to suggest that the bumps that a person has on their skull gives us any indication of that person's personality or what they're like. Okay. But this is what Gull thought um, was the actual fact. He thought that a person's mental faculties, for example, how intelligent they are, how organized they are, a person's personality, for example, how patient they are of a person, as well as any other character traits like kindness, friendliness, rudeness. He thought that all of these things were influenced by a person's skull and the shape of a person's skull or specific bumps on a person's skull, okay? Now, one thing that Gold did correctly was that because even though his theory was pseudoscientific, it was based not much on evidence, um, even though he had all these limitations to it, he did accidentally um, actually bring up this idea of localization of brain areas, which was actually a groundbreaking uh, concept. And it was something that no one else had really brought up before. Localization of brain area is this idea that certain parts of the brain are involved for certain functions. For example, today we know that the backmost part of the head or the backmost part of the brain is involved in vision because of the occipital lobe. Yeah, but back in those days, early on, people didn't understand this idea of localization of brain areas. They thought something like vision was just an all round brain function, that the whole brain was involved in vision rather than a specific part of the brain. But Gull was able to, through his theory, suggest this idea that, okay, if a person has a bump on the side of their head, they're a secretive person. Even though that theory is wrong, the concept underneath that theory, which is localization of brain areas, that area A is responsible for this function, area B is responsible for another function, that idea was groundbreaking. And so that was the one good thing that came out of Gull's phrenology uh, theory. Okay, even though the actual theory in itself was wrong, he did accidentally stumble upon this idea of localization, which is still an important part of psychology um, today in terms of the study of the brain. Um, and it does involve brain mapping, okay, and numbering certain parts of the brain. Um, 
So he would, some examples, I've already talked about the secretive one, but for example, if you had a bump at the back of your skull, he thought that that meant that you had a higher level of self-esteem. Or if you had a bump on, you know, the top of your head, it would mean that you were more of a kind person. So we know that all of that is a little bit like mumbo jumbo. It's not really based in evidence, but the idea of localization of brain areas is something that we still um, depend on today for our understanding of the brain. Okay, so some good stuff in phrenology, some bad stuff in phrenology. So we've got a bit of good and bad in this theory. Okay, so that is the basic idea behind phrenology. Now, we're not going to go to first brain experiments just yet, but those are the three main um, kind of early brain approaches or early approaches to understanding the brain. Um, do you guys have any questions about any of the three that we've covered today? So I'll just go over them again. Brain versus heart debate was the first one. Second one was the mind-body problem, and the third one was phrenology. Okay, we all have a basic understanding of them. Okay, cool, that's good. So what we're gonna do guys, before we go for today, um, I think it's good if we can finish the question so you have less homework. So we'll try to finish that one activity together. So I'm just gonna go back and share my activity booklet again and you guys should open up yours as well. So we're just gonna do activity, um, activity seven. Okay, so let me just bring up the table onto one page so it's easier. Yep, so activity seven is what we're looking at today. We're exploring the early approaches used to understand the role of the brain, which is just the three that we've gone through today. So can anyone remember the name of the first approach that we just went through? You can look into your PowerPoint if you like. Mm -hmm. What do we think? You can put your answer in the chat box as well. It's the name of the approach. Yep, the brain versus heart debate. Good. So we're going to write that there. Okay, what's the next, what's the next one that we would, um, what's the philosopher or the founder? We'll go through them one by one. So who were the people involved in the brain versus heart debate? Okay, if you look into that slide, there are the names of two Greek philosophers. One was involved in the brain debate. And the other one was more on the heart side of that debate. I know they're hard to pronounce, but we don't need to pronounce them. We just need to be able to spell them. So one was, yep, one was Empedocles. Who was the other one? Can anyone take a guess or can anyone remember? Okay, so one was Empedocles, and Empedocles was responsible for the um, heart debate or the heart hypothesis. So you've got Empedocles. And the brain debate or the person responsible for the brain side of the debate, his name was Alcimaeon, which is a little bit hard to spell. I think it was like that. Yep, so you can write that down. So they were both um, Greek philosophers. Okay. Um, can anyone describe the approach? Well, what was the brain versus heart debate? Just like a definition of what it was. So maybe I'll start, start us up with a sentence starter. So the brain... Okay, so I've started you guys off. So the brain versus heart debate basically argued whether it was the brain that was responsible for. Da, da, da. So fill in the gaps, fill in the blanks there. What would we say? Mental processes. Yep, so mental processes. <laughs> 
Okay, so that's basically um, what you would write. And that's basically what the brain versus heart debate was. Yeah, it's this idea that was it the brain that was responsible for thoughts and feelings or was it the heart that was responsible? Today, it is agreed. So that is the basic description. Okay, thinking about this approach, guys, are there any limitations that you would, um, in terms of the brain versus heart debate, what's something that doesn't sit right in terms of this approach? This is not really a right or wrong answer. It's just about your opinion um, of this approach. If someone were to bring up the brain versus heart debate today, um, what would be a limitation or a weakness of that approach? What would be something that wasn't completely accurate about it? You can just take a guess. You can put it in the chat box. What could we say? You can maybe talk about this idea that um, because the heart is more involved with the autonomic or automatic function of heartbeat okay, and blood flow, it shouldn't have as much of a cognitive role in our mental processes. So that's kind of one main limitation that the heart is more of a biological, not biological, but it's very, very important in all those physiological processes, particularly things like blood flow. For example, the heart is what pumps the blood to the brain. Um, so the heart is very much preoccupied with that. And so we can't expect the heart to take on all these other cognitive functions as well. Um, so that's kind of one limitation or one weakness, we could say, of this particular um, approach. Okay, so let's go to the next one. Can anyone name me the second um, name of the approach, the second approach that we looked at? In the second slide that we went through today. Yep, the mind and body problem, good. So. We're just going to name it here, mind and body problem. Okay. And the person, does anyone remember the name of the person that uh, proposed this theory or proposed this problem? Yep, Rene Descartes. Good. So Rene Descartes. And he was also a philosopher. Again, a lot of these philosophers were contemplating. It was all contemplation and all just thinking about what the brain was involved in. Okay, can anyone give me a description of the mind-body problem? I know this one is the difficult part, but even if you can just give me the question that Rene Descartes posed or proposed, or even just a definition of what the mind-body problem is. In fact, I think rather than putting and, we'll go like that. Okay, what would we say? Even if you can just give me like one part or one part of the problem or like a small part of the definition. <laughs> yep, the mind and the body influence one another. Yeah, good, excellent. So we can say that the mind and body are not just separate structures but they influence or affect one another through the pineal gland, okay? This allows for the mind to influence the body and the body to influence the mind. Now, when we say mind, we're basically saying brain, so you can put that in brackets. Okay, so that's the brief kind of description of that approach. Okay, um, can anyone think of a limitation of the mind-body problem? I know this one's a little bit more difficult to do. 
So I'll kind of run you guys through it. So we're, with the mind-body problem, we can maybe talk about the idea that although we say the mind influences the body and that the body influences the mind, sometimes, sometimes we act haphazardly, sometimes we act without any actual um, influence. Sometimes we don't think before we act. Okay, so sometimes we can say that not all functions may necessarily... Habitual. Okay, particular, particularly when we act um, out of habit or when we act in a very instinctive way, or we get like a gut instinct that something isn't right, those actions are not always thought about at length using the brain. So we can say that that might be one of the limitations of that approach. Okay, and the last one that we're looking at is phrenology. So I'm helping you guys out with the name now. Can anyone name me the person who was involved? or the philosopher or the founder or the person that we attribute with um, the theory of phrenology. What was his name? Or you can even just give me his surname. His surname starts with the letter G, if anyone remembers. Or you can look into your PowerPoint as well. What would we say? Yep, his name was Franz Joseph Gold. Okay, or you can just name him Gold after his surname. That's fine. All right. What was the description of phrenology? What, what was phrenology about? Remember we said that um, Gold would often feel a person's skull. What was he looking for on the person's skull? Okay, I think everyone is very sleepy today. <laughs> All right, I'll help you guys out. So when we're talking about phrenology, we're talking about the bumps on a person's skull, yeah? So basically, Gold believed that the bumps on a person's skull, sorry, skull determined what kind of personality they had. That's about it. You don't have to complicate it too much. Um, yeah. And I'm just going to add one more line in the specific location of these bumps. Okay. Um, one of the limitations of this approach, can anyone give me the limitation? We did discuss this one a little bit. What was one of the drawbacks of phrenology? It's to do with evidence, if anyone remembers. Yep, so phrenology wasn't taken seriously. because it lacked experimental evidence. There was no data or research to back it up, in other words, okay? So there was no data to suggest that the bumps on a person's skull told us anything about that person's personality. So that was one of the limitations. Remember guys, when we're talking about limitations, we're talking about the um, negative aspects of that approach or the drawbacks or the uh, shortcomings or the disadvantages of that approach or the weaknesses of that approach. Okay, so I'll leave this on for another 30 seconds so you guys can just jot down the points. So seeing as we've done now, what activity was this activity? Up to activity seven as a class, um, just after the class is over today, just upload this booklet um, up to the activity that we've just done onto the school box, um, onto due work. So I've reopened the due work. Okay, so just you can go in and upload that. Particularly those of you who haven't uploaded from last time as well, just go in and upload this because this is your uh, work for the transition week. Okay, so make sure that you do that. And we are doing the questions as a class. So hopefully this is 
going to save you a bit of time. You won't have much extra homework on top of that then. Okay. Um, right. So if we don't have any other questions, I might just first of all stop the recording here.